Hello, everyone, um, whoever's out there. Uh, greetings from Geneva. It is uh, 6 p.m. here. Uh, I know in other parts of the world you are in uh, at different times. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm whoever's just going to try and uh, mute myself because from... I've got an echo. There we go. Um, so this is the uh, GEO, Group on Earth Observations track. And we are going to start this uh, session with our first speaker, who is uh, Demos or Demos Tenis Traganos. I probably butchered your name. Um, he's going to talk. Well, let, let me give a wee bit of bio. Um, Demos has worked uh, quite around, he's, he's worked in geology in Greece, oceanography in the UK and he did his uh, doctorate in computer science and maths in Germany. And uh, he's done quite a lot of work on frameworks around monitoring seagrasses using open data and platforms, um, also which has been part of the Global Seagrass Watch Technology Transfer Project, which he's been working with at uh, DLR, I think it is, the German Aerospace Center. And uh, he's going to talk about the work uh, being done more, more recently in East Africa and how this can support data-driven decision-making and conservation um, in the context of coastal nature-based solutions. I think this is quite important because nature-based solutions is coming up a lot in disaster risk reduction, in climate action, and in many other areas. So, uh, Dimas, over to you, take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot, Stephen. And uh, hi all from, from Berlin. I hope you can see my screen now. Yeah, okay, I'm going to do that and it should be on. Yeah, so good, good afternoon, good morning, um, good evening to all from, from Berlin. My name is Dimos Raganos, and uh, I work as a scientist the last six years in the German Aerospace Center here in Berlin, Germany. Uh, for the past three years, I have been managing uh, the so-called Global Secret Watch Project. So this is a technology transfer project uh, funded by uh, the German Aerospace Center and supported also by the Group on Earth Observation and Google Earth Engine program. And through this project, we are um, using all of the modern and latest advances in Earth observations, all these great advances uh, paired with open reference data uh, to map seagrasses, to map their seascape environment, and to try to strengthen um, more data-driven decision-making within the world of um, climate action and the so-called coastal nature-based solution. And for those who are not uh, familiar with this term, I will uh, I will go right away and uh, present it. Um, so coastal nature-based solutions like um, their terrestrial counterparts, like uh, tropical forest, um, are featured in this specially interconnected uh, configuration. Um, so this is a typical tropical seascape um, configuration. So seagrasses the mangroves and the coral reefs, and they are uh, interconnected and support uh, each other, so they cannot be seen solely um, as they are seen up to up to today. So now we are trying uh, to uh, not only map seagrasses, but map you know their seascape configuration and all of those great uh, ecosystem services. So these nature-based solutions are based um, essentially on the ability of seagrasses. Um, to sequestrate carbon, to store carbon, uh, and to offer this mitigation to, to countries, but also uh, is based on the on the protection of the coast from uh, from the sea level rise and other um, provisions that can um, support um, the coastal economies and and societies. Um, regarding this uh, seascape configuration, uh, globally, a recent uh, paper found that more than 13,000 square kilometers um, of all of those uh, ecosystems are interconnected. Um, and yeah, regarding seagrasses is uh, often a, 
uh, is saying that Paris them uh, is out of sight, out of mind. So they, you know, they they belong underwater. So people do not know much about them, but they provide um, a plethora of uh, important ecosystem services. Um, three of the most important of those is the reduction of tidal height, which actually offer large coastal protection, as I mentioned, to societies and um, to economies. The, the second one is, of course, the carbon sequestration, which is actually one fifth of what um, our global oceans absorb uh, per year. And another important ecosystem service is the fact that seagrasses um, and the provisioning of um, nursery, uh, nursery and breeding grounds to fish connects to one fifth uh, again of the global fisheries. Um, so you can imagine how how important all of those ecosystem services are. Now regarding uh, the carbon sequestration capacity, which is also connected to the context of um, today's talk, um, seagrasses are seen as a blue carbon pyrohouse. Uh, the blue carbon term relates to the fact that seagrasses, of course, belong to the marine environment. And seagrasses, as you can see, um, can actually sequestrate up to 10 times more uh, carbon than, than the tropical forests. And um, yeah, this important ecosystem service is yet uh, overlooked um, by countries, by, by governments. And what we are trying through our project is to, um, to improve that um, capacity of countries to mitigate um, yeah, carbon. Regarding um, the carbon sequestration capacity, again, uh, today 12 countries have recognized explicitly seagrasses in their uh, so-called national determined contributions. And this is very important because um, other countries can, can, can learn and can also uh, integrate them. And seagrasses are not only seen um, as a part of this mitigation action, but are also seen as part of adaptation actions, which are uh, related more to the coastal protection uh, ecosystem service of seagrasses. Now, regarding the, the known unknowns, the gaps and the uncertainties, uh, there are lots of them. I will mention five. Uh, first is the fact that we have lots of gaps uh, in the world's largest blue carbon hotspots and also biodiversity hotspots. And you can imagine that that is um, negative because we, uh, if you don't know the extent, uh, you don't know the ecosystem services. Um, the second fact is the fact that we have a sparsity also in um, spatially explicit and scalable uh, seascape mapping frameworks. There are also, uh, of course, downstream um, cascading uncertainties in terms of um, you know, estimates regarding the ecosystem services, the fluxes, the losses. And there is also um, a sparsity in terms of the protection uh, of seagrasses within uh, marine protected areas. Sorry about that. So only one fourth of seagrasses um, belong within MPAs, uh, which of course impedes their uh, protection and conservation. And lastly, um, the, the sparsity in data and scalability, of course, impedes also the tracking of progress of, uh, of relevant multilateral environmental agreements, uh, like the Paris Agreement, the key biodiversity targets, uh, marine protected areas, um, etc. Now, um, I hope that these biases and gaps have, um, have highlighted the problems uh, regarding seagrasses and the gaps. Um, so since 2019, um, DLR has funded um, the Global Seagrass World Project, which is a, a technology transfer project. And through this project, we have designed and developed um, a technological ecosystem within the cloud. So all of the components is pure, are purely uh, based within the cloud platform of the Google Earth Engine. Um, and actually, the technological ecosystem involves uh, the, the so-called multi-temporal um, data analytics. So instead of uh, using uh, as traditional in remote sensing single images, 
we, we pair in Mosaic thousands of satellite images to reduce the noise, um, which is fairly apparent over coastal waters. We also use and employ machine learning, um, and uh, we calibrate and validate all of the above with uh, big open reference data. And so this is the technological ecosystem. That is what goes into, uh, into our uh, cloud-native scalable framework. And what goes out as an output um, is first, of course, the extent of seagrasses, uh, of corals, of mangroves, uh, bathymetry health um, at lots of scales, from the national scale to the regional and hopefully someday to the global. Um, the extent gives us, of course, very um, solid basis to, um, to quantify and restrict the biases regarding all of the commodities um all of those ecosystem services the carbon the biodiversity the fish stocks these are relevant again to uh decision making for the environmental agreements and they also pair to uh, they can also uh, enforce uh transparency in carbon crediting frameworks which are mainly using um credit based on mangroves and tropical forests but uh, hopefully, with our work, we can um, also inform more data-driven and transparent um, coastal-related carbon credits. Now, regarding the, the case study that um, will showcase um, all of our developments, um, this is of East Africa. So East Africa was a, a, um, a previously unmapped region. Uh, for seagrasses, it's a largely carbon and uh, biodiversity hotspot. So this um, study area was more than 120,000 square kilometers uh, from zero to 15 um, meters of depth. And for this um, endeavor, we used more than 28,000 uh, Sentinel-2 surface reflectance data. So these are atmospherically corrected data, uh, all available within the cloud. So we, we ran the multi-temporal analytics, um, and I will show you the result later on. And we had um, this data cube. We also used um, uh, a combination of uh, image annotated and available high quality uh, and accuracy reference data points. Of course, these are needed to calibrate uh, the machine learning in the heart of the classification system. and. The result of this, all of those data were um, only 32 gigabytes within the cloud. And to give you um, a good reference, if we were to uh, download all of these tiles, all of those uh, nearly 30,000 tiles uh, on a local server, we would need uh, approximately 19 terabytes and also something more than um, 47 days to download. So that can give you um a first sense of the of the power of the cloud for uh, such efforts um so regarding another cloud which is a uh, namesake but not so um not so good and needs assessment are uh, the clouds which of course is the the first problem in any remote sensing analysis either over the land or over coastal waters and this is actually a mean modis based um, product um, at one kilometer. And you can see here that um, even within uh, this regional um, scale, we have wide ranging um, cloud coverage. Of course, we are talking about the tropics. Um, so that can vary up to 90, I'm sorry, up to 90% um, the whole year. So 11 months of clouds. And for that to be assessed, we um, we needed to think outside of the box and we um, ran the multi-temporal analytics. And that gives you um, a first uh, sense of what this uh, multi-temporal analytics can do. Um, so this is, of course, uh, a mosaic, uh, mosaic that we used over North Madagascar. So over um, a region that we've seen that um, features cloud coverage up to 90% of the time and yeah that um, uh, get rid of the clouds but of course there are also additional parameters that need um, that impede our analysis and need of course uh, their own um, yeah 
their own assessment and solution. Uh, so now we'll guide you through um, the technological products from upstream to downstream. So first we have um, the raw cloud image, and that's a single image. Um, that's the result of the multi timber analytics. So this is two year, I'm sorry, this is two year, uh, three year worth of data. And what you can see here is the deep water, the mangroves and the land, which are of course redundant pixels for um, a coastal, you know, a shallow water analysis. Um, so the downstream product and the result of masking all of those parameters and redundant pixels is what we call an optically shallow composite, uh, which is also analysis ready data. We use that to produce a number of downstream products like the satellite ray bathymetry, um, the bending composition. I'm sure about that. Uh, the bending composition probability, which is a soft probability of presence per pixel of each of the benthic habitats of interest, that could be seagrass, sand, uh, and coral and algae. And then the second tier in our classification system produce um, the so-called hard probability and uh, essentially the classified benthic um, habitat per pixel across the whole uh, regional scale in this um, sense. Uh, another very um, challenging parameter, which uh, varies uh, spatiotemporally, is turbidity. And turbidity is actually one of the most difficult ones because it, it not only varies, um, uh, yeah, it, uh, it features um, a multi-level um, distribution and an extent. And it could be a number of uh, reasons that contribute to turbidity. And what we have uh, developed here is uh, a cloud native processor that gives us an additional um, reduction of this redundancy uh, and noise in our um, analysis. So we developed a spectral unmixing model. I'm sorry again, a spectral unmixing model, which helps us um, map the subpixel. Uh, distribution of turbidity and its subsequent downstream masking from from our analysis. Now, regarding the products, um, the first products, of course, is the seagrass extend. The seagrass extend is the basis for all um, our analysis. So we used, um, as I mentioned, twenty, nearly twenty thousand um, depth and benthic habitat reference data points. All of those were open, and we estimated um, 4,300 uh, square kilometers of seagrasses, which are distributed, um, as you can see, in Kenya, in Mozambique, um, in Madagascar, and um, in Tanzania. And we had a number of different average depths and F1 scores. So F1 score is the, the harmonious mean of uh, producer and user accuracy. Um, and as you can see, um, this varies from 44 um, to 70%, which shows you how difficult um, is um, currently um, such a mapping accuracy. So at the moment, we are uh, trying to increase uh, the mapping accuracy. Uh, because as you can imagine, this is very important um, downstream for um, yeah for for any use of these mapping products for decision making. Uh, we have to improve our confidence um, behind these these mapping products. Um, now we use this seagrass extent um, and we multiply that with uh, existing um, seagrass carbon stock data. Um, which, uh, which were um, site and regional specific, so belonging to the tier two assessment of the IPCC report. And that was a total seagrass carbon stock. And we estimate up to 40 million, um, um, million ton. So that's 40 teragram of carbon. Uh, and most of those were uh, in Kenya. And we suspect that that is because of the, of the very close and especially interconnected configuration, as I presented before, of, of the mangroves uh, and the corals and the seagrasses, which uh, protect each other's ecosystem services and more importantly, 
um, these carbon stocks. Now, regarding the, the next steps for uh, our product, but also um, our current endeavors. So this is um, something that I'm really proud of because uh, it's the first it's the first project worldwide um, that uses satellite technology and data to map um, seagrasses and to actually inform uh, the national determined contributions of seed cells um, to support, of course, climate action in the region. Um, this is funded by the um, by the Pew Trust, US-based Pew Trust, and that's a great consortium of lots of uh, stakeholders, including uh, the University of Oxford, uh, the University of Seychelles, and also um, the Nature Conservancy. So that's something that um, will will hopefully guide uh, future action and also streamline future funding um, within this context. Now, this is another project uh, relating to biodiversity um, that will kick off in, uh, in two weeks' time. So this is a consortium uh, of Plymouth, the University of Nantes, Hidgeos, a French company, and DLR. Uh, that will have a two-year duration and it's funded by ESA. And through this project, um, the scientific aim is to develop um, biodiversity metrics and inventories using remote sensing um, and the frameworks that I presented to you. Uh, we will have two case studies in two um, global uh, biodiversity hotspots, Mozambique and Indonesia. And the ultimate aim is to uh, use all of our mapping products and metrics to um, guide uh, more informed uh, decision making regarding biodiversity. And actually, we will try uh, not only that, but we will try to uh, holistically assess uh, carbon stocks and biodiversity stocks because um, I personally believe that that will uh, that will increase the chances that seagrasses will have in uh, in future uh, protection and decision making. Um, now that marks the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you all for. Uh, for attending. I have put there uh, two links regarding our uh, mapping data and Google Earth Engine app and all of the open in situ data which are offered by the Allen Coral Atlas project, uh, which I personally thank for the great and inspiring work. And uh, of course, last but not least, I would like to thank my team, the Global Seagrass Watch team, um, without whom uh, I wouldn't be here today to present all of these uh, great developments. So thank you all for, for the attention. Thank you, Demos. Can you can you see me again? Yeah, now yes. <laughs> yeah, great. Um yeah, that, that was great. That was uh that 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 is actually something I'd like to see a a, a broader geo um session. I think that's really really good around the you know the, there are so many aspects that you brought into to your to your talk um there are some questions that i'm going to just go through um the first one is um you mentioned ecosystem services a couple of times can you explain what this means yeah so ecosystem services is actually what the name um, um describes is services that are not only offered to uh, to the environment but uh, also to humans um, so that could be the carbon sequestration capacity of seagrasses as i mentioned which relates to climate action um, that relates also to uh, nursery and feeding grounds so seagrasses uh, provide protection uh, nursery and feeding grounds to to fish to one-fifth of the of the largest uh, fisheries. Um, also, they re reduce the sea level rise because they have the ability to, to capture sediment in the water column, um, and that reduces, you know, the, the sea level uh, rise and, and its rate. Um, and it's actually a great umbrella term to, um, you know, uh, quantify and try to uh, increase the protection um, and conservation of seagrasses. Yeah, hopefully that answers the question. 
Thank you. Um, the next one is, is also linked to um, the sequestration point. And it says, what's the big difference or differences between blue carbon and other types of sequ sequestration? Yeah, very good question. So um, regarding the um, regarding the environment and natural ecosystems, we um, we have of course green carbon, uh, which is related to all the terrestrial ecosystems and to uh, mainly forests. But back in 2009, uh, scientists um, uh, have established uh, the consensus that um, you know ecosystems like seagrasses and mangroves and tidal flats um, can also absorb carbon, and not only that, um, they can. Uh, they are much more efficient in, uh, in, in sequestrating and, and absorbing it um, because they have uh, the roots and their roots are much uh, greater than, than those of, uh, of forests. So yeah, I guess um, the main difference is the fact that, um, for instance, seagrasses can have roots up to eight meters, which allow them to store carbon for millennia and that's actually very important in um, in carbon crediting frameworks uh, for climate change mitigation action, because it can store this carbon, it can lock it away from the atmosphere, um, and that comes in contrast to um, yeah to the forest that have only up to perhaps one meter or or so. Okay. So I, I, there's two, two other questions. I'll just go through them quickly to get us back on, on track with time. Um, one is, um, where do you source the reference data points? So yeah, uh, the reference data points is a combination of uh, data annotation that we do in-house. So we use the very same data, the multi-temporal composite, uh, to design um, uh, reference data based on photo interpretation. Of course, that has uh, its own biases. Um, it, um, yeah, because you induce the bias of uh, the level of experience of the Earth observation expert that designs the data. And the other source is the Allen Coral Atlas, um, which is a global mapping uh, project. Um, another great consortium that maps corals. And they have, um, yeah, they have streamlined a huge effort, a global effort to collect uh, in situ data. And we also use that, yeah. So it, it would be interesting to speak more because GEO is developing an in situ data strategy at the moment, uh, which is obviously a global, you know, so it, it's not just ESA working in Africa or other places, but it's like, other other agencies, so that might be quite interesting for you. Um, I think on the other side, it would also be interesting for the people putting together that that strategy. Um, and the final question is also from me. Um, I just wanted to know uh, the work that you're doing on the biodiversity. Does it link to geobon uh, or specifically marine bon, mbon? Um, not that I know of, but I would be very happy to. Uh, you know, to discuss uh, with anyone interested uh, in that context, because it's something um, that we are very, you know, very ambitious, but we know that um, it's very new. So what we are trying to do, uh, and it's also for an important cause, you know, um, inform the, the European Union agenda for biodiversity. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very open to any kind of discussions and collaboration. So I have put, um, I can put in the chat my, um, yeah, my email Perfect. and my contact details. Yeah. Great. Okay, so uh, Eferisto. <laughs> my, my, one, of my, one of my very small handful of uh, Greek words. And uh, we will now move to our next speaker. Uh, thanks a lot, Dimas. Thank you, Stephen. So our next speaker is, um, it, it seems to be the... Uh...